Welcome to a new series on reversible computing. I'm very interested in reversible computing, how it ties into classical physics, also quantum physics as well, which is where reversible computing is currently probably most likely to, to occur, but there's a classical physics aspect of reversible computing I find very interesting, and I'd like to learn more about classical physics. And uh, reversible computing has lots of overlap with relational programming, or at least sort of some intersection of ideas that seem similar, and I'd like to try to understand better um, you know, what, what the connections might be. It's a topic I've been interested in a while. Um, and in grad school, I took a quantum physics, uh, or sorry, quantum computing class from Amr Sabri, and we talked about reversible computing. I found it very interesting then, and uh, recently I've uh, gotten back into it from reading the Theoretical Minimum book, uh, which is a, a great book on physics for people who are interested in physics but are not professional physicists. But, you know, it still actually talks about it at the level of, you know, doing calculus, that kind of thing. And also because um, <clears throat> of, uh, from a programming language standpoint, I'm very interested in uh, the sort of uh, computation. And there's this very interesting paper that I want to read, Reversible Computing from a Programming Language uh, Perspective which is open access. So you can read this paper as well, which is good because a lot of the uh, reversible computing papers are not <clears throat> open access and they're behind some paywall or whatever. So anyway, uh, this is a paper I wanna read. So this is uh, sort of an overview of reversible computing from the standpoint of programming languages, which is close to my heart. And I would like to try to play around with some of these programming languages. There have been a number of programming languages designed for reversible computing, classical reversible computing. I'd like to play around with some of those, maybe implement one, maybe do a reversible Canron, I'm not sure. Um, so that's my real goal is to read this paper and start getting into the papers. Um, so this is going to be a little different than the other videos I've made so far. So for most of the videos, if not all of the videos I've made so far, you know, if I'm talking about Scheme or Mini Canron, those are things I basically know. Like for the R6RS series, yeah, I use R6RS every day. It's not like I have no idea what it is, and it's not like, not like I haven't looked at the spec before or the report. Um, I just haven't gone through the entire report word by word. So, you know, I'm sort of getting up to speed more on something I know fairly well. Uh, whereas here, I I only have a, a fairly faint idea of reversible computing. I've only, you know, read about a little bit, watched some videos on it. I've never actually used it for real. I've never used any of the languages. So this is, you know, me getting up to speed on an interesting topic to try to do research in it. So that's different type of of learning. Uh, once again, I'm not starting from zero, but I never use this in anger. So, um, you know, I, I have a some rough idea of what some of the core ideas are. All right. So, so let's start off with Wikipedia, which is usually a reasonable place to start if you don't know much about a topic or just want a high level overview. And let's just go through and read it. Reversible computing is any model of computation where the com computational process to some extent is time reversible. Okay, so it's a model of computation. There are lots of models of computation where the computational process, okay, to some extent, <clears throat> interesting, to some extent, so it's, it's qualified here, is time reversible. So my understanding is if you look at the rules of classical physics, you can reverse the rules. You know, so if you see um, a billiard ball moving around the table, you know, you could actually uh, reverse the movie. If you didn't see like, uh, you know, how 
how that ball was originally impacted and exactly where it ends up. If you were to take a video of it and then reverse it, it wouldn't be possible to tell if you were watching that video in a forward direction or a backwards direction, at least in an idealized table with zero friction and all these sorts of things. I don't know how, how friction gets involved because that might get into entropy and all that. I'm not a physicist. I have a little bit of background. But the idea is that in classical physics, in theory, you could run the, the movie backwards and you wouldn't be able to tell a difference. You know, obviously, there does seem to be something different about the direction of time in practice, and that seems to have something to do with entropy. These are concepts I'm pretty fuzzy on, but this is something I'd like to learn more about. That's one of the reasons I want to study reversible computing. And it, it also turns out that erasing information is a type of effect, just like we think of mutation as an effect. So a whole bunch of interesting ideas here. All right, so this time reversible idea is important. Let's see. In, in a model of computation, uh, well, I want to be a little careful about going down the full rabbit hole, but let's just see what it's considered a model of computation. Uh, in computer science, and more specifically in computability theory and computational complexity theory, a model of computation is a model that describes how an output of a mathematical function is computed given an input. A model describes how units of computations, memories, and communication are organized. The computational complexity of an algorithm can be measured given a model of computation. Using a model allows studying the performance of algorithms independently of the variations that are specific to particular implementations and specific technologies. Okay, so finite state machines, post machines, post Turing machines, tag machines, push down automata, register machines, random access machines, Turing machines, decision, okay, functional models, combinatory logic, lambda calculus. Okay, so, you know, things like cellular automata and actor models. All right, so we know about things like lambda calculus and Turing machines and push down automata and finite state machines, or at least my guess is if you're watching this video, you've at least heard of some of those things. If you're not familiar with these, you can look them up. Some of these I know better than others, like post machines. You know, I've never really played with post machines. Um, you know, uh, things like uh, con process networks, I've heard of them, but I've never played around with them. Logic gates and digital circuits, I've certainly used those. Petri nets, once again, I have some familiarity, but I've never really played with them. Okay, so we have different models of computation, so we can think of things like lambda calculus and Turing machines. So reversible computing is a any model of computation. All right, so it's sort of like a model that, uh, like the lambda calculus, something like that, where the computational process to some extent is time reversible. Okay, so my guess is that most of those models we just saw aren't necessarily time reversible, um, probably because they're going to lose information. You probably have to augment that model or put restrictions on the model to make sure that it is time reversible, or at least to some extent is time reversible. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, in a model of computation that uses deterministic transitions from one state of the abstract machine to another, a necessary condition for reversibility is that the relation of the mapping from states to their successors must be one-to-one. -one. Reversible computing is a form of unconventional Computing. Okay, so <clears throat> if we have deterministic transitions, so from any one state, we um, know how to go to another state, there has to be a one to one mapping um, from states to the successors. So, uh, this, you know, the classical example in reversible computing is addition, which they might talk about in this article. But if we want to add two numbers, if we have a function, that takes two arguments x and y and gives an output z, and you know, uh, and it's an addition function, and we know the output is seven. Say it's an addition function over the natural numbers. 
well, we don't know what X and Y are because X and Y could be three and four or they could be uh, six and one. You know, they're multiple X and Y pairs that could give us seven as the output. So if if we wanted the function to be reversible, there would also have to be some additional information or some additional structure so that we'd be able to recover the X and Y that led to seven. So that's a critical idea here. Okay, uh, reversible computing is a form of unconventional computing. All right, let's see what they consider that. It is computing by any of a wide range of new or unusual methods is also known as alternative computing. Okay. Mm. Analog computing. Eh. eh, I mean, basically anything that seems weird, I guess. Yeah, whatever. Anything is not the standard thing. It's not Intel and ARM and that sort of junk. Due to the unitarity of quantum mechanics, quantum circuits are reversible as long as they do not collapse the quantum states on which they operate. So this is where you normally hear reversible computing. Today is in the context of quantum computing. Um, and as a general rule... If you're building a quantum system, like a quantum circuit, you need to make sure everything's reversible and there are certain logical gates that are known to be reversible, things like Toffoli gates that you can build reversible quantum circuits out of. Uh, you can't erase information in a quantum circuit. That's considered an effect. And you can't copy a state um, in a quantum circuit. So... Uh, at the, sort of at the end, you can collapse the this quantum state and do an observation. And my understanding is that there's lots of sort of philosophical <clears throat> discussion about what that means to do an observation. Um, this is interesting. And that's where I first really started learning about the reversible computing. But I, I want to look at this idea... <clears throat> more generally and also from the, the classical standpoint, um, not just the quantum standpoint. So in fact, I would hold off, I'm gonna hold off on the quantum stuff. I, I wanna try to just understand the idea itself more abstractly. <clears throat> okay, reversibility. There are two major closely related types of reversibility that are particularly of particular interest for this purpose. Physical reversibility and logical reversibility. Okay, that sounds important distinction. A process is said to be physically reversible if it results in no increase in physical entropy. It is isentropic. Okay, that's a new technical term for me, isentropic. There is a style of circuit design ideally exhibiting this property that is referred to as charge recovery logic, adiabatic circuits, or adiabatic computing. See, adiabatic process. Okay, charge recovery logic. I came across this term recently. Uh, okay, although in practice, no non-stationary physical process can be exactly physically reversible or isentropic, there is no known limit to the closeness with which we can approach perfect reversibility. In any systems there are sufficiently well that are sufficiently well isolated from interactions with unknown external environments, when the laws of physics describing the system's evolution are precisely known. All right, so this is already starting to get a little tricky in some sense from a, you know, needing to know some more about physics. Non-stationary physical process. I've got a little bit of an idea of what a stationary physical process is in terms of a hand wavy way, but it, okay. Th but the, the sentiment I've encountered before and my, my basic understanding is as far as we know, if you have 
a physically reversible system or, you know, something, a system that has certain properties, you could, in theory, make that system arbitrarily efficient. Um, maybe not perfectly efficient. Sounds like that probably isn't possible in practice, but you could make the logical operations operate with as little entropy as you want. You know, like you could, you could always try to make the system a little bit better. Um, if the system, if the computation is reversible. Uh, so this is one reason people are interested in this, even if you're not into the quantum computing and running Shor's algorithm to factor integers or whatever, the fact that in theory, there's no limit to how efficient you can make the circuit perform computation is very attractive. And right now we've, we've definitely hit very serious thermodynamic problems with their chips, which is why the clock speeds aren't increasing, or at least one major reason. And, you know, heat, heat is a, a very serious problem with modern processors and, you know, everything about the chips now have to be designed based on how much energy or sorry, how much power is being dissipated, all that. All right. So that's very interesting anyway. Uh, I don't completely understand this, of course. I mean, I more than don't completely understand it. A motivation for the study of technologies aimed at implementing reversible computing is that they offer what is predicted to be the only potential way to improve the computational energy efficiency, that is, useful operations performed per unit energy dissipated, of computers beyond the fundamental von neumann landauer limit of kt natural log 2 energy dissipated per irreversible bit operation although the landauer limit was millions of times below the energy consumption of computers in the 2000s and thousands of times less in the 2010s proponents of reversible computing argue that this can be attributed largely to the architectural overheads which effectively magnify the impact of Landauer's limit in practical circuit design so that it may prove difficult for practical technology to progress very far beyond current levels of energy efficiency if reversible computing principles are not used. All right, so there's this, <clears throat> there was this result, I think, from the 1960s by Landauer where uh, he showed that there are these thermodynamic limits on how much computation you can do with a given amount of energy. <clears throat> but that's computation that's irreversible, where, where you lose information. And so there is a theoretical, physically-based limit on how efficient you can make irreversible computation. And right now, we haven't hit the Landauer limit with modern um, processors, but we're starting to approach the limit in at least some cases, you know, I mean, maybe we're a thousand or, or 5,000 times above the limit, but it's not like we're a hundred trillion times above the limit is my understanding. And there's reason to think that as the, as the you know processes keep shrinking um, at some point, you know, this is going to be a serious problem. If it isn't already, I know some people say basically we're, we're starting to run into problems uh, related to Landauer limit. There's no way we're going to be able to get, you know, processors that are 10,000 times more efficient um, given our current approaches just because we'll run into the Landauer limit. Okay. <clears throat> by, by the way, there's a researcher, uh, last name of Frank, Mike Frank at uh, Sandia National Laboratories, who has given a number of interesting talks on reversible computing in the context of things like the Landauer limit. So I recommend looking at some of his talks. He talks a lot about how close we are to the limits and the thermodynamics and so forth. So you know, you don't have to be into quantum computing to care about this. Not not to mention just intellectually it's very interesting. Relation to thermodynamics. As was first argued by Rolf Landauer while working at IBM, 
In order for a com computational process to be physically reversible, it must also be logically reversible. So this is interesting. Landauer's principle is the rigorously valid observation that the oblivious erasure of n bits of known information must always occur at a cost of n kt, I don't know how to say this, ln2, natural log2, uh, in thermodynamic entropy. A discrete deterministic computational process is said to be logically reversible if the trans is a transition function that maps old computational states to new ones is one to one function, a one to one function. That is, the output logical states uniquely determine the input logical states of the computational operation. Now, <clears throat> from the mini camera and constraint logic programming standpoint, you know, we, we, usually aren't doing one-to-one -one, um, mappings, you know. So if we do something like the relational interpreter that's used in Barlamin to do program synthesis, that's not one-to-one. -one. So, you know, you might have some expression that evaluates to the list uh, cat, dog, mouse, but it turns out there are infinitely many expressions probably that would evaluate to that list. So it's definitely not one-to-one. -one. Um, and so if we wanted to make it one-to-one, -one, then we'd have to do something different. Now, there are things like normalization by evaluation where you have these normal forms for expressions. So you can go, you have this uneval function and you can say, here's a, here's a value, give me a canonical expression that evaluates the value. You know, I believe that's one-to-one. -one. Uh, I don't know if that's a total function though. I think it is. Well, yeah, I, I don't know. They, anyway, uh, there seems to be interesting relationships between this and normalization by evaluation, which I have played around with in Mini Canron. I can do a video on that. Um, Edward Komet gave me a tutorial on that and gave me some Haskell code, and I've been playing around with that for a while. Um, so anyway, this one-to-oneness is important. It's something we normally don't have in Mini Canron, so I'd like to explore what happens when you do have the one-to-oneness. For computational processes that are non-deterministic in the sense of being probabilistic or random, the relation between old and new states is not a single-valued function, and the requirement needed to obtain physical reversibility becomes a slightly weaker condition, namely that the size of a given ensemble of possible initial computational states does not decrease on average as the computation proceeds forward. <clears throat> okay, this is a new idea to me. All right, so I didn't know you could have a non deterministic or a probabilistic or random computation that's reversible, that's time reversible. Hmm. And actually the condition's weaker. The size of given on so okay, this is interesting. That's very interesting to me, especially since we've been exploring probabilistic programming. So, so mini canron's not really non-deterministic, the implementations aren't. Although in theory you can imagine it being non-deterministic. And we do have probabilistic variants that people have been exploring. Um all right, well, this this is interesting. This sounds like a whole a whole world right there. Physical reversibility, Landauer's principle, and indeed the second law of thermodynamics can also be understood to be a direct logical consequence of the underlying reversibility of physics, as is reflected in the general Hamiltonian formulation of mechanics and in the unitary time evolution operator of quantum mechanics more specifically. So I would like to get to the point where I can understand that statement at some real depth, at least through the general Hamiltonian formulation of mechanics. Um, I'm just going to leave that alone right now. I've got some idea of what some of that means, but um, but the, my, my sort of high-level understanding is, like I said, in classical mechanics, the underlying physics are reversible. So you could 
play the movie backwards and it would look you know equivalent in some sense from the laws of physics um so uh but the you know i don't understand the thermodynamics parts of it so obviously there does seem to be some difference in direction the implementation of reversible computing and, and by the way you know there are also things like maxwell's demon you know um if you're familiar with that argument that's comes down to information and keeping track of information and erasing information and so forth so you know information erasing information thermodynamics and reversibility of physics those are all intimately related and there's one understanding you know that say richard feynman would talk about is that information and computation is inherently physical you can't represent information without being able to represent that information physically somehow as a photon traveling through space or as an atom or whatever there's somehow be a physical representation and similarly for the computation but then there's also another perspective which is that the physical laws of the universe are based on causality and that maybe information is is and causality and computation is somehow more fundamental than the laws of physics or 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 important or critical to the laws of physics. So uh, I, I think people's perspective on these things have changed over time, at least to some extent. So all of these ideas I find fascinating. I don't understand them very well. I try to understand better. The implementation of reversible computing thus amounts to learning how to characterize and control the physical dynamics of mechanisms to carry out desired computational operations so precisely that the experiment accumulates a negligible total amount of uncertainty regarding the complete physical state of the mechanism per each logic operation that is performed. <clears throat> okay. In other words, precisely track the state of the active energy that has evolved, evolved in carrying out computational operations within the machine and design the machine so that the majority of this energy is recovered in an organized form that can be reused for subsequent operations rather than permitted to dissipate, dissipate into the form of heat. Yeah, so my Intel processor and my laptop, right now I can hear the fans are on and the laptop's warm, I can feel it. So what's happening is doing computation in some sense, the amount of computation being done should, you know, in theory, could generate extremely small amount of waste heat or, you know, entropy. Um, but right now, uh, the computations are so inefficient and they're non-reversible that actually tremendous amount of heat is being dissipated. And, you know, Feynman talked about this in terms of thinking of some you know, supercomputer that's doing some massive computation and you know, have, have a giant room full of air conditioners to cool it down, maybe even liquid cooling like in a cray. And the end result is a printout on a piece of paper or, you know, a, a, you know, a graph on a computer monitor, which is the, the amount of information being presented is thermodynamically insignificant amount uh, compared to the amount of energy dissipated in performing the computation. And so reversible computing would mean that you would get back almost all of that um, energy in a way that you could use it in the future and, and you, know, you wouldn't have generated all that heat and you wouldn't have basically turned all of this um, ener useful energy into useless heat. All right. <clears throat> Uh, although achieving this goal presents a significant challenge for the design, manufacturing, and characterization of ultra-precise new physical mechanisms for computing, there is at present no fundamental reason to think that this goal cannot eventually be accomplished, allowing some day to, to build computers that generate much less than one bit's worth of physical entropy and dissipate much less than KT LN2 energy to heat, KN log 2 energy to heat for each useful logical operation 
that they carry out internally. Okay, so there's, according to Mike Frank, there is no fundamental limit as to how energy efficient we can make the computation. At least if there is one, we don't know about it yet. Of course, we don't know how to build that hardware yet. Um, <clears throat> his argument is that we should be trying much harder to do so because otherwise we know we're going to run into a wall um, pretty soon. To get, uh, today, the field has a substantial body of academic literature, a wide variety of reversible device concepts, logic gates, electronic circuits, processor architectures, programming languages, and application algorithms have been designed and analyzed by physicists, electrical engineers, and computer scientists. This field of research awaits the detailed development of a high-quality, cost-effective, nearly reversible logic device technology, nearly reversible, doesn't have to be 100% efficient, one that includes highly energy efficient clocking and synchronization mechanisms or avoids the need for these through asynchronous design. So modern processors have a clock that are used to synchronize the different parts of the circuitry, but there's also this whole idea of asynchronous computing where you get rid of the clock because at least Currently, a lot of the power dissipation and inefficiency and how fast you can run, you know, limits on how fast you can run the processor due to problems with trying to keep everything synchronous with, the, uh, with these clocks. Um, so if you could avoid needing to have a clock, then you might be able to make things more efficient. But right now, that's basically how everything works in modern, modern CPUs is uh, based on clocks. So that's... That's also an area of sort of unconventional computing. Uh, this sort of solid engineering progress will be needed before the large body of theoretical research on reversible computing can find practical application in enabling real computer technology to circumvent the various near-term barriers to its energy efficiency, including the Van Neumann Landauer bound. This may only be circumvented by the use of logically reversible computing due to the second law of thermodynamics, okay, which is, I guess this has been paraphrased as you can't win, you can't break even, you have to play, are the three laws of uh, thermodynamics. Yeah. All right. Logical reversibility. Okay, that was physical reversibility. Now, and so we don't know how to build these... Um, devices yet that are are uh, physically reversible um, have some ideas but certainly we're not making processors that are physically reversible yet at least not in any scale maybe in a research lab logical reversibility for a computational operation to be logically reversible means that the output or final state of the operation can be computed from its input or initial state and vice versa. Okay, so you can have the notion of an input and you can have a notion of an output, but you have to be able to go back and forth between them without losing information. Reversible functions are bijective. Okay, so it's like one-to-one -one and onto <clears throat> in math uh, talk. This means that reversible gates and circuits, that is, compositions of multiple gates, generally have the same number of input bits as output bits, assuming that all input bits are consumed by the operation and that all input-output states are possible. This was something that Edward Fredkin talked about um, in some, some of the talks I've seen him give on reversible computing. So he's you know, maybe the, the biggest pioneer in this field. Um, and, you know, the original Fredkin gate was based on this observation that, well, if you really care about reversible computing, you shouldn't be computing with NAND and NOR and 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 OR gates because those gates have more inputs than outputs. So there's no way you're going to be, be able to make a reversible com uh, computer. You know, all of the gates that you would use would need to have the same number of inputs as outputs. So... Uh, he created a gate called a, a Fredkin gate, which is one way to, you know, one component you can use for reversible computing. Um, but that was this observation. You need the same number of inputs as outputs. 
An inverter not gate is logically reversible because it can be undone. Okay, so in electronic circuits, you know, you often have high and low voltage. You might have zero volts and five volts for the old TTL, transistor, transistor logic gates, for example. So zero volts you would consider uh, false or zero or off, and five volts you consider on or one or true. And then a not gate would take a five volt um, input and map it to zero volts or a, a zero volt input and map it to five volts and, and flip the, uh, you know, sort of uh, invert the signal. And if you uh, took the not gate and ran it backwards or had the signal come in the other direction, then you would have the other effect. So, and you have a not of not gives you back the original, the original value. So, so that's logically reversible. Notice it has the same number of inputs as and outputs, just as one. Um, okay, so logically a not gate is reversible. The not gate might uh, may, however, not be physically reversible depending on its implementation. So, you know, it could be. Even though it's logically reversible, the physical device might dissipate all sorts of of um, heat and generate lots of entropy. You know, if you had a TTL, a TT, uh, um, transistor, transistor logic TTL uh, circuit, you know, those are notoriously um, inefficient in terms of power consumption. So, I'm sure that uh, no TTL gate, not gate, is going to be physically reversible. You can heat your room with a bunch of them, I'm sure. The exclusive OR gate is irreversible because its two inputs cannot be unambiguously reconstructed from its single output, or alternatively, because information erasure is not reversible. Okay, so if you have a gate that has more inputs than outputs, well, then how are you going to not lose information unless maybe there's some sort of time encoding um, Okay, however, a reversible version of the XOR gate, the controlled NOT gate or CNOT gate, can be defined by preserving one of the inputs as a second output. The three input variant of the CNOT gate is called a Toffoli gate. It preserves two of its inputs, AB, and replaces its third C by C. Uh, is it? XOR, A dot B, so this is an AND. <clears throat> With C equals zero, this gives the AND function. And with A and B both being one, this gives the NOT function. Because AND and NOT together is a functionally complete set. You can build any logical circuit out of it, or combinational circuit out of it. The Toffoli gate is universal and can implement any Boolean function if given enough initialized ancilla bits. What's an ancilla bit? Inversible computing ancilla bits are extra bits used to implement irreversible logical operations and classical computation. Any memory bit can be turned on or off at will. However, it's not the case in quantum computing or classical reversible computing. Okay, so these are, yeah, there's this idea of garbage. Um, the ancilla bits end up trashed because the effects of them were not uncomputed. Yeah, so so I guess uh, there's a reversible part of this, and then there's this kind of uh, you know part that's not uncomputed. Mm. For classical reversible com computation, it is known that a constant number of ancilla bits is necessary and sufficient for universal computation. Additional ancilla bits are not necessary, but the extra workspace can allow for simpler circuit constructions that use fewer gates. Interesting. Um, okay, so it looks like some part of universal computation you won't be able to uh, reverse everything. That there's there's this idea of garbage, and there's going to be an idea of the few ancilla bits at least 
and you need a constant number of ancilla bits. So I guess, <clears throat> but as as your uh, the the computation the the complexity of your computation increases, it sounds like you you only need a constant number of those. So I guess you can keep the uh, amount of waste or entropy um, low. Similarly, in the Turing machine model of computation, a reversible Turing machine is one whose transition function is invertible, so that each machine state has at most one predecessor. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, so that's, I, I know about Toffoli gates and Fredkin gates and these sorts of things in terms of a circuit model, but uh, reversible Turing machines, that's cool. All right, I think that was mentioned in Amr's course. I haven't implemented one. Uh, all right, Yves Le Cerf proposed a reversible Turing machine in a 1963 paper, but apparently unaware of Landauer's principle, did not pursue the subject further, devoting most of the rest of his career to ethno-linguistics. In 1973, Charles H. Bennett, a very famous name, at IBM Research showed that a universal Turing machine could be made both logically and thermodynamically reversible. Well, sounds like a very important result. And therefore, able in principle to perform an arbitrarily large number of computation steps per unit of physical energy dissipated if operated sufficiently slowly. Okay, so this is the thing. There is a trade-off between how fast the, the computation can be performed and how much energy gets dissipated. So I may have to compute very, very slowly. Thermodynamically reversible computers could perform useful computations at useful speed while dissipating considerably less than KT of energy per logical step. In 1982, Edward Fredkin and Tommaso Toffoli proposed the billiard ball computer a mechanism using classical hard spheres to do reversible computations at finite speed with zero dissipation, but requiring perfect initial alignment of the ball's trajectories. And Bennett's review compared these Brownian and ballistic paradigms for reversible computation. Okay, that sounds uh, something like something interesting to read. Aside from the motivation of energy-efficient computation, reversible logic gates offered practical improvements of bit manipulation transforms in cryptography and computer graphics. Since the 1980s, reversible circuits have attracted interest as components of quantum algorithms and more recently in photonic and nanocomputing technologies where some switching devices offer no signal gain. Okay, interesting. So if there's no gain with your switch, I guess you have to make sure you don't lose or dissipate any of the energy. So otherwise you'll um, be very limited as to how far you can send the signal, all that, or how many times you can process it. Surveys of reversible circuits, their construction and optimization, as well as research, as recent research challenges are available. Okay, here's five of them. And then see also all these different things. And then a bunch of references. Great. Okay. So <clears throat> that's a quick overview of what this is about. You can tell this is a whole big field. People have been working on it actively since the 60s and very actively on it since the 80s. Um, and so there's big literature. What I would like to do uh, in my next video in this series would be to start looking at this paper, uh, reversible computing from a programming language stand, uh, perspective, because that's close to my interests. And I know that uh, of several languages for reversible computing. And I just want to dive in, uh, partly because, you know, I'm starting from an area of relative strength in that I know more about programming languages than I do about classical or quantum physics, for example. Uh, and also I'm just interested in the connections with logic programming, that kind of thing. So this, I know this paper talks about logic programming or at least compares reversible computing 
with uh, things like logic programming. So that's uh, what I want to do next time. So this is a 27 page paper. Uh, we'll take a little time to get through it. You know, I'm going to do my standard thing based on Dan Friedman, uh, the way he does it, where you read every word. Now, I will say that the paper isn't entirely 27 pages because a lot of it's references. So, you know, it's more like, uh, probably more like 23 pages, but it'll still take a little bit of time. Um, but that's okay. That's okay. So, you know, probably read a few pages uh, in a sitting and, you know, I don't know, get through it in five or seven or 10 videos uh, and try to try to get a sense of, of this high level perspective. And this paper is from 2023. So it's very current up to date. Um, yeah. And go from there. So that's what the next video will be in the series is starting to go through this paper. If you want to find this paper and look at it yourself, it is, uh, open access. So reversible computing from a programming language perspective. That's what we're going to work on. Okay. Thank you. Talk to you soon.